Hey, look at look at his shirt, man. You still a speed demon, Bill? Look at you, bro. He wrote the book. Should drive my skyline, man. <laughs> well, everyone. I'm making one for you. I'm making it for you. <laughs> what can you do about it? Um, my wife didn't have a placard, so I'm making one. Thank you. Look at this. Thank you. Thank you. Second of all, um, yeah, I think, you know, plus it's sat a Sunday morning and everybody's like kind of up late, you know, doing their thing. And I guess they were rocking out at the dance party, you know, last night too. I don't know if y'all saw that. That was pretty crazy, but it was fun. So, um, we got some people coming in. And if they say no, we'll just say fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> we are anyway. <laughs> no, it's a late day. That's a joke. <laughs> okay, so today's topic is uh, care and feeding of Bill Nolan. No, it's kind of like that. Uh, that's why I'm on the couch. I need feeding. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, just, he, he was just fed, too. He was. But he's like that plant in Little Shop of Horrors. So you have to keep feeding him. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today, I think we're good now, I think people are here. We're going to talk about the group, which was a loose uh, term for what they called it. It was based on Mary McCarthy novel, one of the one of the wives of the group members, I think it might have been Helen Beaumont, um, started calling these guys who would get together as a collective in the living room periodically the group, and they were writers. Yeah, they're all writers, and uh, they did some other things too. They did illustrations and things like that. And uh, so, what we're going to do is talk about their whole life of times because their life of times kind of became what we know now as popular culture uh, in the modern era. And uh, it was fed by the popular culture of the times before that. So, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves first, and then we'll get into that. We'll talk about who the members are collectively. I'm Sunny Brock. I'm one half of J. Sunny Productions with Jason, and we did two documentaries, one about Corey Ackerman, who was involved with the group tangentially, and one about Charles Beaumont, member of the group, and that's how we met Bill Nolan and George Clayton Johnson and a bunch of other folks. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know me, I'm Bill Nolan, and uh, I stagger around here for the weekend. Uh, I didn't know how I could make it down here when I when I saw my name as guest of honor last year. I said I don't think I can make it down there. I really don't. So I, I barely made it, and I did fall down outside the building a couple of times. But I, I did make it, and I'm I'm having a lot of fun. And I appreciate all of you people. You've been great to me. Everybody's been very kind. So uh, I'm I'm very happy to be here. And then I'm Jason Brock, of course. You can do that probably. And so that um, process of elimination. I couldn't be William F. Nolan, so uh, too far too young for that. So, um, and I did a documentary, as she pointed out, one about Corey Ackerman, one about Charles Beaumont. And Charles Beaumont kind of was the ringleader of the group. I would call it, I kind of imagine them as like an atomic cell structure. And uh, Nolan Matheson and Beaumont, I mean, and, well, Nolan Tomerlin and Beaumont were really kind of the nucleus of this kind of structure. And they're the ones who kind of cavorted around doing things together, like auto races and going to different events and the, Beaumont mainly hosted everything because he was a very gregarious character and uh, so he was kind of what blew everyone towards each other they were all magnetically attracted to him and then other people started kind of drifting in and these subtopic shell structure ideas like George Clayton Johnson you know uh, John Tomerlin who, uh, well, well he Robert was part of Block. Robert Block later Harlan Ellison sort of way on that fringe, yeah. uh, Ray Russell a little bit. Um, and Ray Russell had started as the Playboy, uh, Playboy Jerry Soul, Jerry Soul, Playboy fiction editor. And then uh, he came out here later and did Mr. Sardonicus and all that. That was for William Castle, I think, right, or somebody. Yeah, he did it for Castle, yeah. yeah. And so, the, so the, Bradbury was kind of like a mentor to them, more or less. We would, go to, we would go to Bradbury's house, he didn't come to our place. He did come to our place one, one time. I invited him. It was a two-part showing of the Dane Curse, and he was a big Hammonds fan. And this was uh, not part of the group. This was when I had a different apartment. I, he did. He didn't show up in my apartment. And he, and he said, and I said, I want to show you something. So I went 
to the back room of the apartment. I got it out and I brought it into the front room and I handed it to him. It was a Golden Age comic, one of the one of the Golden Age comic books. The first thing he did is he picked it up and he and he opened it up and he stuck his face right in the middle of it and he said, Oh, the smell, the smell. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. <laughs> So anyway, that was a, that was part of the group. Yeah, Bradbury was what kind of catalyzed them all. I would say, you know, he was what they read Ray's work in the pulps because Ray actually was a true pulp fiction writer um, who later went on to bigger, better things. But he was kind of the bridge between the pulps and the modern kind of writing yeah, style. Was, yeah. Yeah. And um, so he had an outside impact as a result because his his literary fame eclipsed all that stuff in the pulps. But the pulps themselves, they all avidly read and wanted to write. You wanted you aspired to be a pulp writer. I wanted to be one, but by the time I got in print, it was nineteen fifty five, and and they just died that same year. They all the pulps that died, so I never got to to, to have a story in one of the pulps. So I, I envisioned myself, you know. Uh, I, a, a deadly snake novel by William F. Nolan or something in, in big red letters on the cover of some pulp magazine, but it never happened. So what did you guys do instead? Pardon? What, what did you do instead since the pulps were dying? What did you write for? Well, I, I was in three pulps, but I was in the letter section. You know, you know they, they used to have people that don't, they don't even know what that means now when you say that to somebody. The letter section. They say, what? Just say it was the each, mag each magazine had, had a section on the back where the readers could comment on what they what they read in other issues. And I was in three of those. I was in Planet Stories and Famous Fantastic Mystery. So I, I was in the pulps at the very edge of the pulps. <laughs> <laughs> well, Beaumont actually was in the pulps a few times. And Richard Matheson was in a few. A couple of times. Time, time, each one about twice. But, mm -hmm. but they, it, was, it was an era. The pulps were all dying in the, in the mid-50s. They were all dying. Yeah. So, so with Bradbury's success, that kind of drew some of you. You were all kind of drifting this way because everybody in the group is actually a transplant, except for John Tomlin. He's the only one that was like from California. And so, where was John from? Baker? Was he originally from Baker? Well, he, he lived in Bakersfield for a long time. Where he was born, I don't know. But he he uh, he was a sports uh, announcer in Bakersfield uh, uh, for different sports all over the radio for a long time. Well, he was the only one that was like a local, you know, for a long period of time. He was born in L.A., yeah. Yeah, and um, Bradbury was from Waukegan, was, you know, Illinois, and Bill was from Kansas City, Missouri, and Chuck was from Chicago by way of Everett, Washington. And then... And Ray Ray Block was Chicago. So was Ray Russell, right? Ray Russell was Chicago, yeah. So they all kind of drifted out and found their way toward L.A., you know, and at, when they got here, they started coalescing around Bradbury, and then Bradbury was the one who, then Serling came on. So Serling came for the Twilight Zone, and Bradbury recommended Beaumont and Matheson to write for the Twilight Zone because they had collections out. Right? That's right. What was that's it? Born right. of Men and Woman and the Hunger and Other Stories? Is that, yeah. That was yeah that's right. So Beaumont wrote a book called, he, his collection was called The Hunger and Other Stories, which is a very good collection if you can get it. It's expensive. And then Born of Man and Woman, of course, is a very ill-fated collection because the publisher had a fire and a flood and it destroyed all the, all the stocks. There's only like there were like there. 100 surviving. Yeah. Uh, not a, about 100 copies survived. I think they printed 500 and they had this big flood and they flooded out most of them in the basement. Uh, but some of them were... Uh, I had it for years and, and I, I gave it to uh, Jason as a birthday present, so he's got it now. So, so it's a great book, you know, but Bradbury had that. He gave it to Serling, because Serling was looking for people to help him write Twilight Zone. And he said, here's these two, you know, and uh, he reads them, loves them, and he hires them. And then later, Bill did write at Twilight Zone later with George Ben Johnson, but then George arrived on the scene kind of around this time. And he had uh, he did Ocean's Eleven. He had, he had done Ocean's Eleven with a guy named Jack Golden Russell. Okay, there was a face that was an outline, right? I mean, uh, I don't think I, don't wasn't know, a I think they finally did it as a screenplay. They started as a long outline, it sold as an outline, but mm -hmm. I think they, they did end up with a screen version of it that nobody ever used. I see. And so George arrives and says, "Here's my, here's my entry into the group." 
Yeah, he had a very high Mickey Mouse voice at that time. Later on, it became kind of gravity. And I'm, I'm George Satan Johnson, and that's it's, it's the way I talk now. But his early voice was, they're going inside. we got to stop the blacks. They're going into school. Yeah, that's, that's, the intruder. Intruder. that's from like the Mickey intruder. Mouse. That's like it's being with Mickey Mouse. John. The movie The Intruder came a little bit later than this, but, but, but what he's quoting from is a movie by Roger Corman. That's another thing that kind of pulled them together. So once the Twilight Zone starts taking off, then the Roger Corman starts being, they want to get into films. They already done, you know, books and all this kind of television. They did a lot of TV. They did like Honey West, you know, Rifleman, uh, well, but Route, 60, Route 66, Twilight, you know, they did all this TV, Steve Canyon, so they were all over the TV situation. And then they wanted to start getting I, I, I worked on 20, 25 movies of the week. Yeah, that was Not all Dan of them got produced by any means, but I did work on 25 of them. Yes, yeah, so that was for Dan Curtis, which came even a little later, and that involved Matheson also. By then, Beaumont would, had died, but we'll get to that in a second, But because that kind of splintered the group up, but with the... Corman was mainly the one that was interested in working with him. He started working with Rich and Chuck Beaumont, Richard Madison and Chuck right Beaumont. The Apollo films with Richard Madison. Right. And then Beaumont started helping him out. And Beaumont had written a novel about integration, school integration in the South called The Intruder. I don't know if anybody's read the novel, but it's one of his, uh, it's a straight literary novel. And it was actually taking place at the time of school integration. And he had interviewed this rabble rousing guy who went to the South trying to get these, you know, white people to keep black people out of the, you know, all this kind of thing, keep segregation in place. And that was a character eventually played by William Shatner in the movie. So Corman mortgages his house to buy the, get the rights and to go film this thing in Saxton, <coughs> Missouri. And he hires uh, Shatner and made his, mainly his first leading man role, right? Wasn't that Shatner's first leading man role? He'd been uh, in other he movies. He was on the stage. he did a movie, the I think. The world of Susie Wong, he was on the stage as a leading man, but in films, I think, that was the first one. And really he, good performance. He was very, yeah, very good. He's, he's excellent. And he's a real, <laughs> and he's a total asshole. But the thing is, well, I mean, you know, his character is also. And so what, what happens is, He's not a very nice man, I gotta well, say. Well, you can talk about that in a because they worked together. Because Bill, what's interesting about The Intruder is Charles Beaumont wrote it based on his novel for Roger Corman, who directed and produced with his brother Gene Corman. And then, but what happened, they go to Sykeston and Beaumont. Tell them where Sykeston was. They don't know Sykeston, where Missouri. They know where it is. <laughs> Down, down at the boot hill. Well, he knows what that is. He's from Missouri, so you might know. <laughs> so, um, so what happens is when they get there, or they start looking for people to be in the movie, Beaumont wants to be in it, because he had been an actor before anyway. So he plays the principal, and then he says, I got some friends who might want to be in it. And so he had you and George Clayton Johnson and another guy. O.C. Ridge. O.C. Ridge and another writer from <coughs> later named Frank M. Robinson. He's a science fiction writer. He's in it also. Frank's in it. You can see him really briefly because there's a scene in the movie at the end where they're burning a cross and they're in clan regalia and all this kind of stuff. It's the kind of the climax of the movie. And they pull their hoods off. Pull their hood off. There's Frank. Like, real briefly. <laughs> and uh, Frank was an interesting character because he himself was a gay man. Very closeted gay man. He later became Harvey Milk's speechwriter. And so he was a gay man, but he... <laughs> He ran the. He was a the managing editor for a, a, one, a, a men's magazine called Rogue, which was a Playboy imitator. And then later he worked for Playboy as the Playboy advisor, but he was gay and nobody knew, yeah. including Hafner. And so he was doing all this stuff about what kind of couplings go with this, and should I have an orgy with blowjobs or not? <laughs> so it's like it's like he's advising all this heterosexual stuff mainly. You know, at the time he's in the sixties. And uh, so, interesting character, and he didn't come out until he was in his 80s to his family, because after he was in Milk, he's in the movie, as an in, in, a, as, in a cameo with Sean Penn. Yeah. Sean Penn's character as Harvey Milk comes out, and uh, there's a real powerful scene in it if you've seen the movie, and Frank is in there, and he's wearing a Kangol hat, the old guy with a Kangol hat, big mustache and glasses. He said that after that scene was done, he went and came out to his own remaining family. He was 80 some years old then. Wow. They had never known. And so, pretty amazing, pretty powerful thing. So, Frank is in there briefly. 
And um, it's a great movie. If you can see it, it's really powerful, and I think that Roger Corman's best film. So yeah, definitely, yeah. So that kind of all pulled you all together. But by this point, Chuck Beaumont was getting ill, right? Yeah, he did, with the first traces of, uh, of his illness. I knew him very well since since we've been together for ten years, and I, I knew him intimately in the in the sense of his character and what he was like. And he started doing little strange things, very small little changes in his character. And I thought that's odd. That isn't like Chuck. That is. And uh, later on, we found out it was the first uh, the first part of the disease was showing itself. He died in 1968. He was 37 years old. It might have been 1967. He was 67. He was 38. Because you started writing Logan Ryan in 67. And so he died the same He year. never lived to see Logan Ryan. No. So when he, what he had basically is what I've come to think of as, uh, is probably frontotemporal dementia, which is a type of dementia that is very severe and can attack very early in one's life. And it's terminal. So there's no cure for it. So he became progressively unable to care for himself and had to wear diapers all the time and had to, you know, couldn't feed himself or clothe himself and he wound up eventually just becoming unable to talk or communicate or anything and then he died in 1967. So it was pretty horrible because it started about four years prior. And so he's had this gradual decline into, you know, spun out into nothing. Thank you. So so that after that, after he dies, they start getting, they start kind of finding their own voices in the group, right? Because Chuck Obama had an outsized influence on them. And so he, his death kind of uh, liberated them in a way to go find their own voices and things. And that's kind of when you start really blooming and George and other people with yeah, Logan Ryan. We, we were making a big breakthrough just at the time Chuck was dying, really. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what continued on. And then Dan Curtis came <coughs> in shortly thereafter. And Richard Matheson got you involved in that. And you start working with Dan Curtis on things like the Norlis tapes and all this kind of stuff. So the group has had a lot of influence on people throughout, you know, modern era of history. Now, I'm going to turn this over a little bit to my wife so she can talk to you about the process of the film. Why did we do this movie? What the hell? Well, I think... We were trying. We, I think, I think we were thinking about um, doing a movie about Ray Bradbury at first, but we'd seen that there was a lot done in that vein, and when we started talking to folks about Corey Ackerman, which we were in the middle of, the name Chuck Beaumont kept coming up, and we were a little bit familiar with Beaumont's work, more so Jason. But people kept saying, you know, this guy was really fascinating. There's not that much out there about him. Why? What was he about? What was he doing? Why was he so influential? And we decided to go ahead and dig into his life and interview people. And when we put it together, we realized that, like Corey, Beaumont's ripple effect across the whole genre was very intense. I mean, and all these folks, I think they brought something new to science fiction and fantasy and horror. And I think George Clinton Johnson explained it the best. Instead of having a big monster or some uh, crazy aliens or things like that, what they were bringing was, in George's words, a touch of strange. And what if you just had one element that was off or weird, but it was otherwise a normal situation, and how would that play out? And I think that kind of, that new thinking really infiltrated a lot of what, what we see today. Yeah, especially people like Spielberg and others yeah. that worked with them. You know, because Spielberg started with, you know, he worked with Serling very early on. His first real big thing was the Night Gallery. Um, thing with Betty Davis, and then he did, you know, things with Duel with Matheson and people like that. So they kept going into this modern era. Yeah, Duel Duel was an interesting thing. It was one of the last stories that uh, Richard Matheson wrote. He said, "I'm giving up short stories." He said, "I'm going to do scripts and uh, novels, but no more short stories." But he did write the Duel. He he was playing golf uh, somewhere on some golf course, inland the golf course. I don't know where exactly it was. With, uh, with with Jerry Soul, who was also one of the members of the group. Jerry Soul did a lot of work for television and films, but nothing outstanding. No no really big breakthrough novels such as The Intruder or Logan's Run or something like that. But but a good writer. So they were they were playing golf and they heard that uh, Kennedy had been assassinated 
and they were so depressed they stopped the golf game and got in their car and started driving back to LA. Meanwhile, this big, big, dark, smoky, greasy colored looking truck, the giant truck, 18 wheeler, I guess, started coming up behind them and pushing them along this road, this mountain road. And, uh, and, and that immediately got out an envelope and started making notes about a story about a, a truck, that truck that chases the guy, uh, chasing the car. And, uh, and that was the, uh, the origin of Duel, but they didn't know who was going to direct it, and they had various names, and then somebody said, there was this young guy, Stephen somebody, Field, Spiel Bad or some damn thing, <laughs> never heard of the guy, but he wants to direct it, I don't, I, that, that's a big risk, putting that in his hand. Well, it was, the, it was the start of Spielberg's career, because he did a beautiful job in directing it. So that that's how yeah, I think that's that how Duel happened. I think that in the movie and in the I think it's also in the in the in the story, Chuck's Cafe is like a nod to Charles Beaumont because that that was his yeah. name. They always called him Chuck. Okay, and uh, weird thing about it, everybody in L.A. called him Chuck, and everybody who knew him in Chicago called him Charlie. <laughs> that's and right. he wrote an he wrote an essay that's never been printed called "Don't Call Me Charlie," <laughs> and uh, it was a <laughs> so he was not like yeah. so so he. Uh, so I think the Chuck's Cafe thing, where Dennis Weaver pulls into the like, and he kind of harasses those guys eating, is uh, I think that's like a nod to Chuck Beaumont. So, but yeah, Duel, great movie, and uh, they went on to do great and uh, other great things too. I mean, George has done a lot of television, also, you know, Kung Fu and Star Trek and you know, Twilight Zone, and, and also I don't know that George did a Night Gallery though. I don't think he did. No, no, he didn't. But Matheson did. Matheson did Night Gallery and. Um, Rod He's about the only one of the group that did on Night Gallery. I think, I think yeah, and they all, they, Matheson did Twilight Zone, Night Gallery, and Star Trek. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and he did all three of them. Yeah. So, you know, but he was just sitting in his house writing all the time. He never went anywhere. You know, so. yeah, when the group would get together, we'd all go over to Matheson's house and uh, settle down in his living room and, have, and, and talk, each one trying to try out talk the other one. Uh, coming up with all kinds of crazy ideas and everything, but uh, Matson never left his house. He was always a homebody, taking care of his children and his wife and all. He didn't. Uh, the rest of us were off running around L.A. doing all kinds of stuff, and he was always at home. But they did a lot of crazy things at home. Um, <laughs> Beaumont and Matson both played piano, so they would get together and, and play piano together. And Jerry they, Soul also. Did. Yes, and they would also. They had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and I we have a bunch of them that Bill has, and they would get together and write these little skits and act them out on the tape, and we have a bunch of them. They're fascinating. Crazy. Yeah, there, there's this one they all kind of acted out that Charlie, <laughs> that Chuck Beaumont wrote, and it's called the Matheson Twins in Mexico, and it was because Richard Matheson and his wife were thinking about moving to Mexico to escape the states, and uh, <laughs> and Chuck wrote this thing to convince him not to, saying that there's a bunch of you know, banditos down there that are going to kill them and all this. And, uh, and what was the line in there? Well, yeah. uh, John Tomlin, who was part of our group, uh, he, he was a guy from Bakersfield. He played, he played, the, he played this Mexican bandit that knocked at the door of the Madison House in Mexico. And when the door opened, uh, he, he said, we, we, we want everything in your house. We want all the goods in your house. We want to take everything. And, and he said, well, you better not because... My husband would would stop you. He, my husband's the head of the house, and, and he reached behind him into a sack and pulled out his head. He said, "No, you're wrong. This is the head of the house." <laughs> <laughs> and, and they didn't move to Mexico. Uh, so I wrote this little skit, and they all recorded it with these crazy voices and all this. Oh, you're ugly, you know. Let's get him back here. Matheson's and killed him. You know what I mean? It's you know. It is what it is, but it's, we were, it's a we were, all, we were all ham actors, and we loved doing different voices and all, and uh, we weren't all that good, but we were very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> they did a couple of those, and, you know, had those on real for real, so that was fun. And, and, um, but they were always doing gags with each other and traveling. You and Tomerlin and Beaumont were always traveling. Well, tell them about what happened with you guys with some of your travels. Well, we, we, in 1960, we traveled to Europe for the Monaco Grand Prix in, in Monte Carlo. And uh, so we, we did we did fly to Europe and we flew there on the last one of the last of the piston piston planes. Everything else was a jet plane, but this was one of the last of the 
piston plant to the only one we could get to, to meet the schedule so we could get there in time. And the damn plane was falling apart. I mean, it uh, it began leaking from the roof uh, on the seat, and Chuck had to move his seat because he was getting wet from this leak on the roof. The baggage door jammed. We couldn't get our baggage out. But the worst thing is we're, we're halfway over Greenland. Greenland is a very rough country. There's no landing areas anywhere. It's all trees and rocks and everything. We're halfway across Greenland, and, Ch and Chuck Beaumont nudges me on the shoulder, and I said, what's wrong? And he said, See that propeller? See on the wing there, see that propeller? And I said, Yeah. He said, Shouldn't it be going around? <laughs> and I, I said, Yeah, we've lost an engine. Oh my god. L losing an engine over Greenland is not a pleasant uh, experience. I'm telling you, you think, well, it puts a strain on the, all the other engines. What if one of those goes too? If we, we lose two of them. Uh, and luckily, we didn't lose any more engines, and they found a landing place and landed and changed engines, and we, we went on. <laughs> he said, shouldn't that be going around? Then you can imagine them coming home and going over to Matheson's house and embellishing and telling this story, and then think about the Twilight Zone episode yeah, that may have, may have come from that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was uh, pretty crazy, because when you got to Monaco, you also crashed Princess Grace's inaugural, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they had a big inaugural for, for Princess Grace and, and, and the prince, and, and they were supposed to appear in, in their in their evening clothes, and everybody at the inaugural was supposed to be in a tuxedo. All the men were supposed to be in tuxedos. Well, we didn't have any tuxedos. We just had street clothes, but we wanted to get in there. And, and so we went to the doorman who we knew with the doorman who worked for Road and Track, who's a friend of mine, and I said, Can you get us into the gala without a tuxedo? And and he said, Yeah, I can I can divert the attention of other people and you can slip in behind me. <laughs> and that's exactly how we got into the gala. We were the only two people in the room with without tuxedos. And, you, you were going to eat, but you couldn't. Oh, we, we were going to eat, but we just done just done a huge meal <laughs> at another restaurant, and, and so they, they kept serving us with, with with different plates. You know, it was very high class food. Everyone was in a different plate, and we would just dabble up the plate, maybe eat one mouthful. And finally, this this tall guy in an apron comes over and says, "I'm the chef. You you do not like my food." <laughs> He said, no, no, we're, we're just not hungry. <laughs> but you did see Princess Grace and Princess Oh, Prince yeah, there was, uh, halfway through the meal, there was a drum roll, boom, 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 boom. boom. Everybody stood up, and, 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 and a spotlight hit the door, and here comes Princess Grace in an all-white dress. I remember that beautiful white dress with, with a prince on her arm, and, and she walked regally across the entire room and sits down in the royal chair and everything, and boy, and that that's that was royalty. That's my taste of royalty. I mean, <laughs> I was very impressed. Yeah. So you had a good time, and then so when Chuck started getting ill, well, how did that affect you personally? And the rest well, of I was you? very depressed because he was he was like you are my best friend. Well, he was my best friend, and to see your best friend slowly losing his mind, he uh, one of his favorite movies was the King Kong, uh, the the old the old original King Kong. And I remember we visited uh, Chuck. He, they finally had to send you to a home uh, for for senior citizens, uh, and uh, we visited him there. And and he came out of the uh, the back part of the building, and he said, "Oh boy, I've just seen a great movie that I really is really a good movie." And we said, well, "What did you see?" He said, "It's called King Kong," and and we we realized he was in big trouble because that had, that had been one of his favorite movies, and he he didn't he didn't even know it. Uh, <coughs> to to answer you, I was very sad. I was very sad about it. You're one of his pallbearers, right? I was one of the pallbearers. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad. Pretty, you're a pretty young guy, you know, too. So, what else do you think about? Forey, Chuck, because Forey was involved. Forey was Chuck's agent, and he was also Bill's agent. And so Forey Ackerman, you know, he did Famous Monsters of Filmland, and he did with Jim Warren, and he did. He was uh, very active as far as sci-fi fandom, of course, everybody knows. But he created a lot of this interest in what we would call preserving, you know, these kinds of things, you know, modern culture, you know, related to film and comics. So Forey had a big impact on Chuck because he was the one that introduced Chuck. Did he introduce Chuck to Ray? Do you know I don't him? know. I, 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 I don't know how they met. 
Uh, I do know that uh, the Chuck was working at Universal in the Mimeo department. At Universal, he wanted to be a writer, but the best he could do was get into the Mimeo department. And uh, how I met Beaumont is that I, that I was on my way to San Francisco, and I stopped by for lunch at Universal, where Chuck was was working there. And, and uh, at the same time, Bradbury was working there on, on it came from outer space. And uh, he said, I'd like you to meet this young guy. He, he's got a lot of talent, and he's very nice. His name is Charles Beaumont, so here comes Beaumont out of the Mimeo department with his ink-stained hands. And uh, that's how I met Chuck Beaumont. That was our first meeting. Fascinating. So out of these little things, all this other stuff starts kind of getting permeated throughout the culture. So I've got some time here. I am. So any questions for Bill or anything about the group yet? Yeah, I had a question. You, you mentioned one incident with King Kong with signs that, that Charles Beaumont was declining. You, were there other things you mentioned? There were other things you began to see? Oh, uh, what other things do you remember about Chuck? What was mm -hmm. off when he started getting ill? The signs that he was doing. Well, it's just, you know, when you know somebody really well, you know exactly what their behavioral patterns are and, what, and how they're going to react to things. His reaction to things it was a little bit off at, all the time in the, in the early stages of the thing. It wasn't quite there. He would react to something in a different way, and I'd say, gee, that, that doesn't sound like Chuck. I'm, I'm amazed that he would react that way. None of us had any idea that he was uh, under this influence of this disease, and he began to drink in the early mornings to, because he knew something was wrong, but he couldn't figure out what it was, and the doctors couldn't figure it out either. So he began drinking every morning, and he was drinking more and more in the morning. We all thought he was turning into an alcoholic, and uh, it was it was all his desire to, to try to cover up this disease that was driving him crazy because he didn't he didn't know what it was. Uh, so that 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 was another unhappy. He he would invite me over for breakfast, and there'd be a martini on my, you know, on the table. I say, yeah, I don't drink martinis at ten in the morning. I think that's that's a little early for me. Yeah, he had a lot of other problems too. He, uh, what Bill's describing is what I would call emotional mobility. And so he would have inappropriate emotional responses to things, which is very common in certain diseases like uh, some forms of Parkinsonism and ALS and these other kinds of things. But frontotemporal dementia affects the frontal uh, lobes of the brain. And Boma had a, if you look at his pathological history, he had uh, had about a spinal meningitis as a child where he was bedridden for a long time. And I have to think it was probably like viral meningitis. And he slowly healed up over time. And as, but as a result of that, they think he developed a Syria, he developed a, a migraines that he had for the whole remainder of his life. And he was self-medicating the migraines with a thing called Broma Seltzer. And at the time, Broma Seltzer's main ingredient was uh, aluminum. And so they know that aluminum has deleterious effects on the brain. And so it may have fed into this problem. He so it made it worse. Made, right. it made it much worse. And so as time went on, because he took the bromo cells for like huge quantities of it, like every day to deal with these headaches. He probably also had a tremendous rebound effect on that, you know, because when you take some of these things, your body kind of builds up tolerance to it. It rebounds. It makes it worse sometimes. And so, but they didn't know a lot of that then about the meds. So bromo doesn't have aluminum in it now. I think it's still around in some form. But, um, they don't even Make it anymore. It's well, they may know. Yeah, it's um, So they, so he also, so after he starts getting ill, they start trying to tie these things together. He has a series of exams and stuff at UCLA Medical, and uh, they eliminate. They decide that he either has a early onset Alzheimer's type dementia, or some form of what, what they call Pick's disease, which they're very different as far as the way they manifest and their pathology. But since he never had an autopsy because his wife was religious, she, they were Catholics, they uh, they don't, we won't know. We will never know. It's just a diagnosis by exclusion. So for me, having been researching it, he had a couple of other things that made me think it was frontotemporal dementia specifically. And those were, one, he became less inhibited sexually. Okay, and that's a sign. That is a sign. And a diagnostic criteria. And then another diagnostic criteria is he had halting speech where he talked like this. And he had been very articulate before. You know, you know, kind of how I'm motoring on. He would motor on like that. 
So he, and then he, that changed. That was a radical change, right? His speech pattern. Well, it's, when the speech started that way, we knew he was in, in deep trouble. You don't, uh, we, we come in to visit him at his home and, 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 and we say, how you doing, Chuck? And he'd say, I'm doing much better. And we said, oh boy, that, that, that's bad. You don't talk like that. And, and unless you're in trouble. See, what was happening is his brain our brains are made of billions of neurons that, that connect with each other and communicate with each other. That's how our brains work. The neurons were being covered over with a plaque because of this disease, and they had to find their way around each other and find new pathways in the brain for him to operate. And that, that, that was slow going and not easy for the, for the thing to happen because the, the, the neurons had to find new pathways to take care of the, the, the plaque that was forming over a lot of them. So uh, he, he had no control of any of that. He knew something was wrong. The doctors knew something was wrong. Those were the early days of Alzheimer's. People didn't know anything about Alzheimer's. My theory is he had an early version of Alzheimer's called Pick's disease. That's my theory. Well, augmented by the chromosome. So Alzheimer's. He, he had bromide poisoning and Pick's disease. Alzheimer's is not Pick's. They're different. I know. I know. But, but he but, did but have a, share some of the elements. Yeah, but it, the main things that make me th point him in that direction is the lack of inhibitions sexually and the halting speech. Those are not form things with Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's patients can become like basically they, they can't speak anymore. Okay, but they don't have this halting kind of strange speak. They usually are articulate. They just either don't make sense or they're making context references you don't know or things like that if you've ever been around something like that. But he wasn't doing that. He was just doing, he could not, his articulation actually stopped. And then he, uh, later he, uh, from what I understand, he, I never met Chuck. I was born in 1970. So he, I think later he also was doing sometimes semi-aggressive things or he would laugh and cry inappropriately, which is the emotional ability, which is part of this whole... Or grab his children's food. Yeah, well, you do that. But, uh, <laughs> gotcha. So, he would, yeah, he would take the food away from him and eat it. Now, one time he almost drowned his son in a pool, and, uh, it's, it, you know, so he was doing these really strange things that he never would have done, of course, as a normal person or as an Alzheimer's patient. And so when I did, dug into it more and more, and I talked to his main uh, biographer, is a man named Roger Anker. And when I talked to Roger, I said, my theory, Roger, is he has fronted some moral dementia, and exacerbated perhaps by the bromo seltzer and the, and, the, and the spinal meningitis. And Roger tends to agree, based on his own research, because he's been writing Beaumont's biography for 35 years, and uh, not every day. But, you know, it's, it's, so I said, eventually the book, the the time of <laughs> the length of time Roger has been writing this book is going to be longer than Beaumont's life. <laughs> so he could have been like, you could read a page a day, you know, and like in real time to live his life. But um, is that, he, Roger's been working on this a long time. Yeah, 32 years for a book. I mean, uh, Logan's Run was written in three weeks. Beaumont <laughs> <laughs> well, only lived 37 well, years. Different so. there. So you would have a, a happy Q&A? <laughs> yeah. I, I, know, I should know this because, you know, y'all are chronic, like, responsible for that like, first interracial kiss on TV. Thanos' first, you know, solo is Logan's run number six. Um, every single movie that Spielberg worked in um, after Duel, Matheson was somewhat involved and all these things. So you have, like, your tie with popular culture. But what I meant to ask is why um, did it take y'all so long to, you know, be mad chronic again? Because, you know, when, when Chuck died, you guys blew apart like that. I'm like, why did it take you so long to be like Netflix and chill, you know? Why is it why is one? Let's take this slowly. This <laughs> 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 generation, yeah. So, uh, why did you, after Chuck's death, you tried to find your own paths, right? So, as you would. What took you so long to reintegrate and come back together, you know, hanging out together with George and John and all that? You had a lot to do with that. You discovered that we, we drifted apart and you brought us back together. And, uh, you, you. Know, you. This man did a lot for me. He deserves a lot of credit. Well, what happened was during the process of doing the documentaries, 
I, of course, wanted to interview the mom, right? Because it started out a little bit different, as she was saying. Yeah. Why don't you explain okay. this part? Yeah, we started doing the 4 documentary, and we were interviewing a lot of the same people, and as we got more interested in the Beaumont story, same people involved, we started interviewing people for both things at the same time. Um, and eventually, Forey, we, had fit, we were almost done with Forey, but he was at the Worldcon in Scotland, I believe, and he had a serious accident. And we didn't know if he was going to get better or not, and we didn't really want to capitalize on his illness and put the movie out right away. So we kind of put that one on the back burner and focused more on the Beaumont. And we had interviewed almost everyone for Beaumont, and we were sitting at a place um, in Pacoima with George Clayton Johnson in a Mexican restaurant for hours and hours and hours. I think we were on like question number two. But finally, <laughs> George goes on. But finally, George says, Well, the person you should really talk to about Charles Beaumont is William F. Nolan. And Jason says, Is that guy still alive? <laughs> so. And sure enough, he was alive in Bend, Oregon. We had moved back up to the Portland area, Vancouver, Washington by then. So we were like, yeah, we're a few hours away. Let's let's check him out and hook him up. So we went over and and interviewed him and became fast friends. And, and things happened after that. But after we talked to all these guys, they said, oh, yeah, well, I haven't talked to so-and-so. And, you know, so many years, and I see him every once in a while. We were like, well, you know, you guys need to get together and work some stuff out and talk and hang out more. So... We just started hooking them up and making them see each other. So we would go over to Bradbury's house, we would take yeah. a go with us, or, yeah. or we would go to these, I would put together a book and I'd have a big signing and we would all be together yeah. that way, or we did a premiere of the Charles Beaumont documentary, the, the Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles invited us to it, <coughs> and so we showed it and we had a bunch of industry people there, and <laughs> we're running out of time, but well, we got some time. There's two weird things that happened with that. The Egyptian sees the movie, uh, Grant Moninger, who's the, he's the, uh, the programmer for the Egyptians uh, theater. <laughs> he's a friend of mine now, but he saw the movie, he liked it, he wanted to show it. And I said, okay, yeah, sure, well, I'll coordinate something. So he told me what to do and promote it. And, uh, and so we had a huge turnout. We had about 400 people there. And so we also had like a, a lot of people in the film or who were new, the group members, doing a signing for a book I had done coincidentally called The Bleeding Edge. And so we had Bradbury there and John Tomerlin and uh, Bill and George and uh, thank you and uh, Earl J. Hamner Jr. who was uh, the creator of the Waltons and Falcon Crest and all that because he'd also done Twilight Zones and things like that. So they were all there doing this signing. But the night before, I had a problem because there was a guy doing a competing Beaumont uh, related documentary. Okay, and he had started it several years prior, and he was friends with the family, and he was also in the industry. And he, uh, I didn't want to step on his toes or anything because he'd already been involved in this. But Mark Scott Zacree, who is a Twilight Zone expert and aficionado, he said, don't worry, there's plenty of stuff to say about Chuck. Just do your film. And, <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, uh, okay. And so he says, great, great. And so, and then um, after that, I do my film and it gets done. And the other guys is still not done. And so the guy at this point was coming up to Portland periodically. And he was, I, I like him, but he was a little bit haughty because he was in the film industry as a camera person. And he said, and he was a friend of the Beaumont children and the family. And he says, well, I got this movie and it, I've been working on it, man. You know, let me show you what I got. So he wanted to see my footage and know who I interviewed so that he could then go out and scoop, <laughs> scoop me. And uh, so I said, okay. So I kept, I said, oh man, I don't know if I can get them. They're just too big shot for me. You know, and I'm just an outsider here again. So I really kind of fucked with his mind, actually. And um, so, but he was kind of being condescending to me. So I figured, I'm, I was like, you know, it like kicked in my competitive nature. And I said, I'm going to fuck this guy. And, uh, and so, so when he comes in, and I've got like this three hour long cut at that time. You were there when this happened. Yeah. So he comes in and he had interviewed you and, so they had, and Richard Matheson and a few other people. And he says, did you get like Harlan Ellison? And I'm like, oh man, I can't get Harlan. Harlan's a tough one, you know, blah. I don't know if I, oh gee, I don't know. And so he shows me his movie. And it's about 45 minutes long. This is after three and a half years, okay? 45 minutes long, real kind of static shots and interviews, the same questions. And mainly what he used was like 25 minutes of footage from the Twilight Zone. 
which was going to require a lot of clearance and to the yeah. tune of about sixty thousand dollars. He said, and I was like, "Well, I didn't do that." And so he says, "Now," I said, "He says, well, let's. I'll show you my film, and I can watch yours." And I said, "Okay, but only if we watch yours first. We did that at my house. Then I showed him my cut, and I didn't see his face, but y'all saw his face, and y'all said he was just like gobsmacked. Yeah, he's jocking like. He said I can never match that, and I can never afford to pay for the footage that I that I used, and so the whole thing died right there. Yeah, he had Peter Coyote narrating and all this kind of stuff, you know. And it, I mean, it was interesting that way, but it was nothing like the thrust of our it, film. It wasn't like our film. This guy, um, this guy was. A guy who does like the little shorts in between movies on like Showtime, you know, the little abouts. And that's what this really was. It was one of those little things. Our movie, we wanted to feel like a home movie, like it's intimate, like you're in these people's houses, you get to know them, we were let them tell the story. So it was a totally different approach. I think I think ours worked better for what we're trying to do. He was just shocked, you know, because he couldn't <laughs> believe it. And then I had people in there like you know, Harlan, I did have Harlan, and, yeah. and you know, he had not been able to get Ellison. And so other people were in there that he could not get a hold of. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm glad he liked it. And then he just kind of disappeared off planet Earth and just, just <laughs> didn't even bother anymore. We have hard time since then, though. No, I mean, he was a nice guy, but I mean, I mean, he did try to put me on the spot and say, well, I got the family. And I'm like, you know, whatever. So they're telling me I have to wrap up. So, any other questions here? Well, you start to say something happened the night before the screening. Well, the night before the screening, what happens is there's a famous Hollywood producer. His name is Don Murphy, and he did *Apt Pupil*, and he did um, *Transformers*, and he did *Natural Born Killers*, and he's a very well-known, uh, somewhat well-respected producer. Anyway, he's a uh, he, his the name of his production company is Angry Films. And ah, something. Yeah, and that, that's a lot about his personality. He's one of those, you know, fucking Irish guys, you know, who gets pissed off real easy, I guess. And so what happened is he was friends with the Beaumont family. He's been developing a film about Charles Beaumont's life along the lines of It's a Beautiful Mind. And so he had been working with uh, Christopher Beaumont in the film, to write the film. And so the night before the Egyptian screening, he starts texting me and saying, listen, you motherfucker. You're never going to show this fucking film, and I'm going to ruin your ass. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. he says, I know what you fucking did to the Beaumont family, you piece of shit. And blah, blah. This is like what he's saying to me. And I'm like, going, boy, this is not going well. And because I'd invited him to the screening. And he, uh, <laughs> and so what happens is he gets really, he gets more and more profane. And uh, he says, the, what's going to happen is my fucking lawyers are going to crush you with my giant balls and I'm going to destroy you and you're going to have a cease and desist letter and you will never fucking scream at the Egyptian. Ever. And I'm like, this is the night before the screening. And I'm like, he was going to shut it down so so we'd, we'd be at the Egyptian with 400 people and they had nothing to show them. Yeah, because they'd already bought tickets. So Chuck became, I mean, uh, Jason became very nervous about whether or not he'd, he'd be able to show the thing right up to the moment that we started to show it. He wasn't sure we'd ever be allowed to do it. Nothing happened, luckily. And I was not crushed by giant balls. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, and then later he bought the movie on DVD. We know because it was going to his address. Yeah, and, we do that. and so he get, he buys the movie, and I was like, "Oh shit!" Here's Don Murphy. He's buying the movie. He watches the movie months later, and he writes me his email. And he says, "I watched the fucking movie, and I gotta say, it's fucking brilliant." <laughs> <laughs> so it ended well. So, it ended well. Thanks for that's it. That's it. Thanks for, thanks for